So hello everyone, welcome to WizConnect, connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. My name is Sagar Kapoor. I'm part of customer success team at Tableau. So WizConnect is a weekly community call which helps you connect with the art of data visualization and storytelling. We have our YouTube channel. Go ahead, subscribe to it. Some great content waiting for you. We have a LinkedIn group. Go ahead, connect with each other and learn from each other and follow the hashtag WizConnect on Twitter to get updated with all the latest sessions with respect to what we have in future. With that, let me just go ahead and just uh, introduce the speakers for today. They, we have Tableau Zen Master Jim Dinner and Kalm Hartley today. I will just go ahead and introduce Jim. So Jim is a Tableau Zen Master and Forums Ambassador with a passion for helping students and new users discover Tableau and develop visual analytics skill Proficient, he is an independent BI consultant specializing in data analysis and visual analytics with a background in engineering and marketing of consumer products. With that, I will hand it over to Jim to talk about when to scaffold your data. Jim, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sagar, I don't see my share button. Oh, there it is. Thank you. There we go. Good morning, everybody. It, and I'm sorry, it's morning for me. It's like 5.30 in the morning where I am. So uh, I hope everybody's having a, a very good day. Today, I want to talk about scaffolding and how you use scaffolding to restructure your data. And there are times when uh, the data is not structured properly, so you just can't answer, uh, answer the business question that you're faced with. Now, we're going to take a look at three cases today, and these are actual use cases from questions that came into the forum came into the forum. First, uh, just a little bit about me. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, as Sager said, I'm a, uh, I'm a BI consultant. I have degrees in engineering and marketing. I do not have a degree in data science or I'm not a computer scientist. So my background is all in engineering, engineering and marketing. I'm a four-time forum ambassador. And uh, yes, I am, uh, I am a Zen master. Today, I want to talk to you about uh, data sets that have voids in them. I don't know about you, but when I learned Tableau, when I first started working with it, the assumption was that uh, the, data, the data set was solid. And by solid, I mean, if you think like a Tableau or a uh, Excel spreadsheet, and every cell has a piece of data in it, that's a solid data set. But in the real world, that's not how data sets uh, exist. They've got voids in them. They've got gaps in them, and you have to be able to deal with uh, deal with those gaps. Some of them are very sparse and have uh, more gaps than they have data, and that kind of comes from it's not dirty data, but it's come it's the way the data is uh, developed in uh, in the data source. That's particularly true of ERP systems like uh, like SAP or Oracle because they're transaction based. They only record, I mean, they only record data when a transaction takes place. Today, we're gonna to look at three separate use cases and, and all of them need some sort of uh, scaffolding to, uh, to solve, the, uh, solve the problem. The first use case is, uh, it, it's a classic in, uh, in Tableau and it's what's known as the two date problem where you have a start date and an end date then you want to determine a cross of portfolio of, uh, of investments, for example, what your cash flow is going to be each month. The second happens when the data is very solid. It's a solid data set when it's aggregated. But when you start drilling down in that data, all of a sudden there's, there's voids and there's sparse data and the analysis falls apart. And the third is kind of an interesting case. It's when you hit a small null in the data and all of a sudden your screen goes blank and it's nothing else. Let's start with the two date problem. And uh, once again, this is a problem that comes about in a lot of different ways. Question comes up at least once a week, maybe two, three times a week. When somebody's got a data set, and they've got a start date and an end date, and uh, they need to know everything that happened in between. And this is the sort of thing that if you were a uh, portfolio manager and you had a lot of investments or annuities, you'd want to determine what your cash flow was going to be every, uh, every month. Now, our particular problem that the um, member wrote in on uh, on the forum was he was an HR manager and uh, he had a number of job reps open over the course of a year and he knew the date that the 
job was open and he knew the date that the job was filled. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to look over the year and he wanted to know how many jobs he filled each month and how many jobs were open each month. He wanted to look back on that. And he, uh, his question was, uh, was pretty simple. He says, look, I've done all kinds of things. I can't get these dates to line up. He said, what, you know, what am I doing wrong? And how do I go about solving this data? Well, the problem here, if we, if we take a step back, the problem was he had two independent, independent dates. They were on a record, but they really didn't know each other. And what he really needed was a calendar so that he could put them all on the same calendar. Well, in his case, he was looking at months. So it was pretty simple to create a scaffold uh, that looked at each month. And uh, it was uh, January through December, and he was only looking at one year, uh, 2020. And I created a scaffold that looked at uh, the first date of each month. Then we bring that scaffold into the data source, and we join that scaffold, we join the dates together. Tableau, there we go. We join that with, with what's called a Cartesian join. What our objective is here is to take every date, every record in his, in his data set, in his raw data set, and attach it to each date in the scaffold, okay? And you do that by creating a uh, join clause where one equals one, and that simply means join them all. If you don't know how to create a join clause, this would create a relationship. We used to call them join clause, now we call them relationships. Open it up, type it in, say okay, and that on both sides. We just, one equals one, and now each, each row of data in the raw data set is joined to each date in the scaffold. Okay, now we can open up that data set. Now, now we can open up, open up that file and it's beginning to look like a calendar. We got the scaffold months in columns and we've got his start date and his end date. And all we have to do is fill this in to determine what jobs he filled and what jobs were still open. Let's take a look at the fill data. Fairly easy calculation. And all this really says is, look, if the date that the job was filled equals the date in the scaffold, and date trunk takes us to the first of the month. So if it was filled during that month, then record the job ID and we'll, uh, we'll count those up. And we bring it into the data set. And sure enough, now we can look and we can say, well, you know, this job was filled in October and yeah, October, October, and so on. And if we total down the list of jobs, we get the total that were filled in each month. So that would answer his first question. Now, his second question was, how many jobs were still open? You know, I had jobs that were open. How many jobs were still open? And we can do that in a, with a similar calculation. And here we just look and very simply, all this says is look, if, if the scaffold date is greater than when the job was open, and if the scaffold date is less than when the job is closed, then record the job ID, the uh, job ID. And we can bring that onto the canvas. And we can look and we can see, well, this, this job was uh, opened in October and it's still open, it hasn't been filled. So it's, it's open in October, November, December, and so on. And then we were able to look across the entire, uh, the entire data set and give him the results that he was looking for. We want to take a step back for just a second and take a look at what the problem was. He had data that was not structured properly to answer the business question he was trying to solve. And what we were able to do with the scaffold is we were able to look and show, well, what he needs is a calendar. And we were able to create that calendar using the scaffold. And then once we created the scaffold, the calculations needed to determine what was closed and what was open each month were really fairly simple uh, LOD expressions. His question came in, Sort of like, well, what's the formula for figuring this out? Well, the answer was there's no formula. You first have to restructure your data. Okay, I want to go on to this second example, and this is uh, in this example we're going to take a look at a uh, inventory analysis. We're drilling down at an inventory analysis, and what happens when the data becomes incomplete, and, and how it creates uh, problems in the data. Okay. I think to do that, I have to spend just a minute. My, my background's in, in product management and uh, 
there we go. Uh, understanding of systems and, and how how they work and, and doing forecasting and uh, inventory analysis. Uh, ERP systems provide very accurate, very accurate data. We're going to take a look along the sales hierarchy and along the product hierarchy. And these ERP like uh, SAP and Oracle capture data information as a transaction takes place. And at the lowest level, and what we're looking at is the transaction that created the sale. It is precise. We know exactly who bought the product, who was a customer, when did he buy it, okay, what did he buy at the SKU level, at the stock keeping unit level, and the quantity and units and dollars. And then the uh, ERP system goes along the hierarchy and aggregates that, just adds those values together along the hierarchy. So we go from the product level, the product line level, and up to the total sales. Now, all this data is very accurate, but it gets less use as we go up the hierarchy. There's less use for total data. There's a whole lot of use for the details. And we take that data to do some forecasting, okay? And when you start doing forecasting, everybody kind of works the same. You start at the top of that sales pyramid and you say, I've got some very accurate data at the top of that sales pyramid. Maybe I'm going to in, increase it. I'm going to put some background for growth, or I, I know we've got a new customer, so we're going to we're going to include that in our in our top level data. And then we're going to break it down. And we get down to a time period forecast that we can hand off after we're done with this process. We can hand that off to the production planners, the production schedules, schedulers, and they can actually schedule um, actually schedule production. So our most accurate data at the top is that sum, total annual sales and total quantity. And then we start disaggregating by product, by SKU, and by some time period. And now you're looking at, uh, do you sell more product in the summertime than you do in the wintertime? Is there some seasonality there? And at least the products I was associated with, we sold them to some of the mega, mega retailers. And uh, they'd come in at certain time periods for promotions and there'd be a great big block, I mean a huge block of sales on one particular week. Take that data and create a forecast and forecasting cycle would forecast once a month and then you'd look out four months into the, uh, uh, the planning period. And up to this point, we're just playing with numbers. And we hand that off to the production schedulers and the planners and they start buying, pro uh, buying components and they start scheduling production. They make, they make product and all of a sudden we're back to some very precise numbers. We know exactly how much we're how much was produced, which SKUs were produced, and we're now putting them in inventory. Well, you can see as you go down the down this pyramid, the data is getting less and less accurate, but it's becoming more and more useful. Now, all uh, every production planner that I've worked with and product manager that I was and then, and then I work with, look at one metric to kind of use it as a barometer to see is the forecast accurate? Are we making too much? Is the inventory getting out of control? And that metric is days on hand or days sales or just days. Very simple calculation. You just take your inventory and units, divide it by your average daily sales, and it comes out, it comes out days. Well, that's where the question came in to the forum. We had a uh, inventory planner or a, a uh, product scheduler who I uh, wrote in a question, he said, look, I'm, I'm doing this calculation. I want to calculate my days on hand, very simple calculation. I just want to take this number, the inventory, and divide it by my average daily sales to get days on hand, and it looks really good. But then when I start going down into the data, something's wrong. I don't get the same numbers back, and it, it, looks, it looks really bad. So I started looking at his data, and it, it looks something like this. He filters so that he, he's just looking at the last date in the data set, there's data behind this, and he's looking across customers. Well, first you can see he's looking at the customer level, he's already pretty far down the period. And then he's got this number, which is a calculation. We're going to take a look at this calculation. And what he's doing to calculate his average sales is he says, I want the average sales over a week, that's the current record minus six, and that's going to give me my, uh, my average sales. And I started looking at that and I said, well, wait, that's records, that's not days. So, I'm sorry, 
So what happens when I open this up? And now I can start looking at, let's take a look at customer B. Just, just focus on this customer for a second. I can look over his last seven records of sales and you can see the last record here is on the 27th of February. Seven records earlier was the 10th. He wasn't calculating at the week level. This was 17 days worth of sales. Okay, because we're talking about scaffolding, you know where this is going. What we needed to do is we needed to fill in all those missing dates. Dates where you need the actual date. You, uh, you need the actual record in the data set. You have to use that in a calculation. So you need the actual record in the, uh, in the data set. And his data, if I force, by just going up here and if I force it to show all the missing records, you can see what his data really looked like. I mean, there were all kinds of holes in this data. This was a very sparse, very sparse data set. So to build a scaffold, I went out to Tableau Brand. Okay, you could use uh, AlterX or you could use Excel, but we're beginning to get the volume of data that uh, Excel is a little cumbersome and, and CREP does a really good job at this sort of thing. And all I did was take the latter dates, his first date, his last date included every date and the customer. And the first step was to create a ladder that we could use for the scaffold. And it's nothing more. And here's our one equals one clause where we're doing that Cartesian join. We wanted each date on the ladder to have each customer name. That's all we did there. The second step in the ladder actually makes that last calculation, uh, calculation and joins them together. So now we end up with 366 records in the data set. And when we come back and we take a look at that data after the scaffold, we can see these data filled. We needed to do one additional thing. Instead of looking at sales, we were looking at the ZN sales. All we did was use the ZN function for a zero null function because we had, a, we had a hole in the data, but there was a real record and we just filled it with a zero. And you can see now over that seven day period, we're looking at an actual week's worth of data from the 29th which is actually the last week, the 27th, up through the 23rd. You can see that he had almost 67 days worth of inventory and not the number that he had previous, which was about 11. So now let's take a step back again. I mean, if you're the inventory planner, planner or you're the production scheduler, you're getting two different messages. One message says, hey, you got to make more stuff. And the other message says, no, no, you got plenty of inventory. And that, that was his problem, getting him to the point that the data was consistent and uh, provided him the answer when it took a scaffold. And we used that scaffold to fill out that data set so that every date and every customer in the data set was represented at, e at each point. We got one more example to look at and hopefully we'll have time for a little question. Now his data was very sparse. This problem comes about when there's a void in the data set. A couple of records are missing, maybe only one record is missing. And when you hit that combination of dimensions where there is no record, I call that a no record null, okay? There's two types of nulls. There's an empty cell null, and that's what we created when uh, we scaffolded the data, and we can fill that empty cell null with a ZN. But when there's a no record null, you can't, you can't fill it the same way. But something very interesting happens when you hit a no record null. Uh, as you uh, as you filter the data. We're going to take a look at Superstore data. That's the same data set that you got when, uh, when, uh, with your copy of Tableau. And uh, I want to take a look at what happens in the data as we look across two categories, two subcategories, art and envelopes. So we take a look at a couple of dates, September and uh, February, and you can see, well, if I look at February, uh, if I look at these two dates, I've got some sort of calendar shows me what's going on. I take out September. Okay, now that's beginning to look a little strange. And if I take out art, all of a sudden there's no data and it returns a blank screen. And I see this question coming up more and more. This is about a once every other week question or maybe once a month question where somebody says, my screen went blank. I've got to have something. It's got to return something. My user doesn't know what's going on. What do I tell them to do? Okay. We can see why this occurs. We took, take a look at the underlying data. This is that same data set for February of 2016. And you can see here for envelopes, for example, which we were looking at, there's no data. These are no record nulls. Well, we're gonna go back 
This brings us to the question that the user wrote in on. Uh, this user, uh, she's a really, really, really good analyst. Um, and she wrote in this question, she said, look, I've got this data set. This is, she used Superstore data, just like I'm using, but her real data was, was something else, obviously. And she says, I've got this data set and I've done a, a small multiples uh, presentation. And if you haven't used small multiples, by all means use them. It's a great way to look across an entire dimension and see what's happening at each, each level in that dimension. And uh, just uh, Kevin Flurlich does a great job of presenting that just by the way. And she said, I've got this data. And when I filter the data, I've got the 17 subcategories. We know there's 17 subcategories. They're all represented. And when I filter out September, all of a sudden I got 13. And she had the two obvious questions. She's, you know, first of all, what's going on? And second, how could I possibly explain this to my user? Well, once again, we had to go back and provide a ladder, scaffold the data. And in this case, the first step in creating the scaffold is I wanted to look at all the dates. And that's from 20, uh, the first of 2016 to the first of uh, 2020. And join those with a Cartesian join to all the subcategories. Now, when we did that, here's the one equals one again, that resulted in about 25,000 records. Okay. The second step is to join that back to her data using a uh, left join. We want all the scaffold dates involved. We joined on subcategory, we joined on date, and it ended up with about 28,000 records. But as we did that, let me just move over here just a little bit. After the scaffold, this is what her sheet looked like. And we've got September and we got February in there. I can take out September and she still has the 17 categories. Four of them now have zeros. Once again, we put in a Z function on sales. Four of them now have zeros, but they're present in the data set. And she was able to communicate to her end user what, uh, what the problem was. We take a look at the data that's underneath this and you can see the ZN function here in envelopes again. Profit and sales don't really have any values, but there is a place for a value, and now the ZN function puts a value. Okay, those are the three use cases I wanted to share with you today. Scaffolding happens to work on those and understand what we're doing. We're restructuring the data. It's not that the data came in was dirty data or bad data. It's just that the data source it came from only provided a limited amount of data and it was insufficient to answer the business question that was being asked. As analysts, as data scientists, I would, I would ask you to think about your end user. Understand what their inputs are, understand what, their, what the use of their analysis is. Who's going to use it next and what do they need to know? They won't understand things like sparse data. They won't understand the voids in the data. It's really not their job. They're subject matter experts and they're great at what they do. But it's your job as the data science to understand, hey, wait a minute, there's some things I have to take into consideration. And what's this data gonna look like? And what do I have to do to get a consistent answer? That's what I wanted to cover today, uh, Sager. The, this file that you saw is out on my Tableau public site. You can go down, you can, you can download it. Uh, a write-up similar to what we talked about is out on my blog and you can download that also. And uh, this is my contact information, that's my email information. And my, uh, my Twitter account. Sager, if, if there's any questions, I got time for a couple of questions, I think. Sure, I, I can. First of all, thank you, Jim, for sharing all the best practices for scaffolding the data. So Tim is asking how best to approach keeping a scaffold, example, calendar, automatically up to date. Wow. Now, here's what, here's, I, I'm gonna take uh, a little step back and suggest to you that probably the best place to keep your scaffolding up to date is, is in your data source itself. If you can't do that, you can bring data, and this is where things like uh, Alteryx, I, I say Alteryx, you might say Alderix, uh, a place like uh, Prep or Alderix really, come, uh, really comes in handy, and you can keep those files up to date and do like a um, a wildcard union, if you will, in prep, 
to keep your scaffold up to date and run the flow and then feed that data into Tableau. Or you could do it in, uh, in all directions. I saw a very good presentation at the last uh, uh, Fringe Festival that was held in December uh, using Alteryx on this. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think, okay. I think if you have any follow up question, just put it into the chat and I can just go ahead and ask Jim. Okay, With I'll, that, stop sharing. I'll stop sharing. Yes. I'll turn my sound off. Sure. I have just one announcement before I hand it over to Callum. Let me just share my screen. So, uh, thank you to Jim. We are starting a monthly Visconnect Data Doctor session. So in that particular session, Jim will go ahead and answer all the calculation queries and doubts you have with respect to in Tableau. So go ahead, join our Visconnect LinkedIn page. All the details will be shared over there. We'll go ahead and create a form and share it with you. And every last witness of the month, Jim and I will just go ahead and answer your questions for that. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Jim, for this particular initiative in Visconnect. With that, let me go ahead and introduce our other speaker. So Callum Hartley. So Callum is a lead data visualization engineer at Expedia Group. He specializes in data transformation to speed up the time from raw data to insights. With an uncanny ability to solve complex problems, he is the brain behind visualization tools seen more than 40,000 times in the last year by the analytics team. With that, I will hand it over to Callum for his session. Callum, over to you. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay. I can see your screen. Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, so um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, so what is it? Uh, uh, Callum, sorry, I think uh, your voice is. I'm not able to hear you. I think you have to keep. keep no, it's unplugged from my head headphones. Is that better? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, yeah. So, uh, as I was saying, then, so visualization uh, should bring data to life uh, and enrich the user experience and not add complexity and hurdles. So, um, in order to do this, uh, we need to simplify. And in this session, I'm just going to share five uh, simple tips uh, to help you to do this. So tip one then, uh, starting straight away, is to uh, make better use of KPIs. So um, on here, we've got an example. Um, so this is just something I sort of quickly put together. Uh, and this is based off things that I've seen over the years um, across different places. Um, and I'm sure that everyone, um, if you've got more than 10 people who use your Tableau server, um, you've seen a vision, you've seen something like this, a dashboard that looks like this on your server. Um, and to be honest with you, there's nothing really inherently wrong with it if it's something that you want to explore. So, um, for instance, we've got all the all the data is there. You can explore through. Uh, you can interact with filters. You can search for a product. Um, you can look for a different year and things like that. Um, you've also got like a breakdown of subcategories, so you can actually explore tools like this. And for some audiences, they want to just have all the data there. However, we want to give this a little bit of a makeover. Um, and to start with, what we're going to do is we're going to add in some different KPIs and we're going to add in a different structure to make this um, a tool that will work for different types of audiences. So I'm going to run through a few examples of some good KPIs that we can use for this, um, that you can uh, use these sort of uh, examples and bring them into your own work. So the first example we've got then is um, a KPI that um, has so you know KPIs are they're more than just showing a number at the top of the page. Um, they're a way to um, you can add in more detail. So in here we've got from going from the top uh, the top left we've got what it is. So this says you know for instance this is showing the total sales, um, and you've got the actual value. Um, and in here we've got a kind of hierarchy across the KPI. So on the bottom left, if you're kind of reading from the sort of top left uh, across, um, on the bottom left we've got a trend. So you can see. 
that 2.94 million, it will give you an idea of is that increasing or is it decreasing? Um, that's also brought to further life by using a tooltip on that as well. Um, and then also you can see which are the biggest contributors um, towards that as well. So you can see the technology in here is the biggest one. Um, if you want to take that a step further, um, on here we've got a, uh, a second uh, example of that KPI. So this can actually be a separate KPI or you can actually uh, include something like a parameter action or include a show and a hide button that has uh, this second version of this KPI where you've got your first measure um, and you can also split that out into different lines. So say, for instance, if you didn't want to show uh, furniture, office supplies and technology as bars, you could show the individual trends for those as well and maybe switch between them using a parameter action or a filter. Um, for maybe something you might want to sort of include a little bit further down the page um, is this example here where you've got, for instance, total orders. Um, and then just by using something like a reference line, you can show what the target was. And then if you're above or below that, um, you can even have the bar be a different color if you're um, sort of say below the line, for instance, rather than above it. Uh, and, then, and again, all of these examples are things that are taken from projects that we've worked on um, as a team recently um, and things that we, we like to include. And here, this is just another example, just for a bit of inspiration. Uh, so if anyone wants to sort of um, take any of these as examples, uh, this is an example where we've got, for instance, what the header is and then um, showing the percentage of a proportion. So this is quite good for having at the top of something that say measuring targets, kind of similar to what we had with the orders one previously, but this just more shows the proportion of a whole. Maybe if you're trying to sort of meet what, the, what something was last year and show kind of the proportion of that. So there are your four examples of KPIs. So moving, if we kind of think back to our previous example we had um, when we started with that sort of big table and kind of sort of not quite, you know, not, not very nice looking visualization. This is maybe a better way to um, think about, about the kind of structure to how you'd show that. So what we've got here is this is, um, this is an example again of something Based on, based on something, uh, uh, techniques that we apply in our team. Um, we have this uh, concept of basically a scorecard. So a scorecard is kind of a bit of a buzzword that I've heard um, about recently, but this is our example of a scorecard using the Superstore sales data set. And um, on here, you can see things like sales, profit, or quantity. Um, we've got that same KPI that we took from the first, uh, the first KPI example. And then we've got that applied to different uh, measures. By using different colors, it just sort of helps to show that there are different, um, different categories on here. Um, and this is really a good example of something that maybe someone from the leadership team would maybe just be able to go in and just get what they want from that. So rather than having to, everyone having to explore that sheet that we had on the first page, this is just a, a version where someone can really quickly go in and say, right, this is the, this is the information I need at a glance. Now, if you're an analyst, for instance, and you want to go in, or maybe you're putting together a deck for something and you need um, a bit more information, you could then drill through to maybe a deep dive on this. So say this is continued through from our sales theme, and then we've clicked through from there, and then we go into our sales deep dive. So on here, again, this is just some examples that I, that I made and nothing sort of too crazy or anything, but you know, obviously on here, you can have like, you can add um, different visual elements. So we've kind of gone for this sort of tile theme in here. And again, this is something we use quite a lot. Um, breakdown for countries. Um, we've got sales broken out into the different categories. Um, and then, you know, we've also got some uh, filter options here. So again, this view is good for maybe like an analyst or a sort of product manager, for instance, who'd want to go in uh, and then maybe put some stuff together for, um, for a deck. But then obviously that first page we had, that actually had some kind of elements in it where you could just explore through almost on a row by row basis uh, on that. So this is where you'd have uh, an even sort of deeper dive into the data. So maybe like something like this, which is maybe, you know, we're calling this a sort of diagnostic tool, but this is maybe just a real sort of row, row level sort of uh, view of the data you could have. Um, so this kind of allows you to, again, we're sort of keeping this tiled view, we're keeping the KPI going throughout the same thing just to sort of remind us of what the overall data is. Uh, but then we have a bit more control in the data here. You know, we can we can have this sort of row, row level uh, view of the data and we can do sort of complete exploration of the data. Again, if in the previous page we saw maybe a funny blip or something on one of the days, we could explore into, we could drill into a particular day in here to see where that's coming from. So that's our kind of, 
before and after. I kind of got those in the wrong order there. It should be sort of the other way around. But um, yeah, you can see what we what we got to and where we came from. So from just having this one view that, um, again, as I say, I've seen lots of stuff like this, uh, having this one view um, and then letting all users uh, use this. The example on the left is a better example of a way of giving uh, different users a different type of experience depending um, on their use case. So they can start from that first page of um, just looking at the scorecard or go through into different levels. Um, one sort of final thing on this topic is um, one thing you probably noticed there is kind of a um, almost like a how you'd read this and going from sort of left to right. And, and this sort of thing is based on certain like eye tracking studies. So there's been several eye tracking studies uh, like this, and, and they all sort of show this kind of F pattern. Um, so you see, you know, you've got the kind of, as you'd be reading through a page, so you've got, so sort of, this is looking at the Google homepage, uh, and you've got uh, starting at one at the top, going across to two, and then sort of reading down results in that, uh, that sort of way. And this kind of thing has been incorporated when you look at examples like Facebook, um, you can see that um, they've also incorporated something like that, where they've got, you know, the name, uh, then you kind of log in details, a description of what you've got at the sort of third part, and then moving across to create an account. And you can see lots of different examples like that. I'm just showing you this as one, but there are loads of different examples where you can see that um, this kind of information hierarchy across the page. Tip number two um, is to utilize tooltips more. So why use tooltips? So I've seen this example before, so this isn't um, this isn't kind of my own sort of observation, but I've seen this on, on a, a previous um, session a couple of years ago where someone mentioned about thinking of tooltips as being something like this, which is like, you know, a children's pop-up book. So again, imagining that someone who is maybe, as say like a, in a leadership team, for instance, um, would maybe want to just sort of have um, the high level views, but then if they wanted to, they rather than having all of the information on the page, they could just lift up certain things um, and look under them to see what's contrib uh, contrib contributing uh, to them. So some examples of how we kind of like to use KPIs. So going back to that um, example we had of our deep dive report, um, on there, for instance, we had um, a breakdown by country. Um, and then we had, for instance, uh, say sales for, for Belgium. Now, if we wanted to see what the trend was for that, rather than having a whole different tile or a whole different view for that, uh, we could just inc incorporate that sort of detail into the tooltip. So uh, again, a tooltip is more than just um, just number and then showing it in the tooltip. Again, you can do something like this using Vizin tooltip in Tableau, where you can just um, pull through the trend for how Belgium is. And you can see, is that increasing or decreasing? Another example is, for instance, here we're looking at France and for instance, we can see that France is doing really well, but is it made up of a particular category? So is it one particular category that's really driving its growth? So by using, again, this is using Vision Tooltip again, um, but you can see that, for instance, office supplies and technology are the main contributors for uh, France, uh, France's growth. Um, so yeah, this is, this is again, going back to that idea of using the sort of lift the flap book. Um, this is kind of looking under the detail of France lifting up the flap and then seeing underneath that, what is that what is that sort of um, big bar made of? And it's made up of those different categories within it. And again, you can take this um, to the extremes and you can add quite a lot in the tooltip um, to show what's behind certain data points. And it's not just data that you have to show, uh, you can show behind your tooltips. So in this example, we can actually expand on wording. So sometimes when you've got labels, uh, for instance, on this, um, uh, on this visualization here, um, when you've got label, it's actually hard to include everything in there. So rather than just having technology copiers, you can say total sales for copiers in the technology category, for instance, is this is X amount. And you can also show stuff like, again, uh, down 15% on last year. This is an example of the pop-up book where you can just see um, how is this performing versus a particular period. And then in the, in the example on the bottom right, this is showing uh, how to interact with a button. So say on here, we've got a button that can show the last seven days or the last 28 days as your comparison period. Um, on this example, uh, we can just use, we can use a tooltip to show like, what does that mean? So you can say, select this to show the last seven days because my um, abbreviation on my, on my button just says L7D. So some people might not understand that. So again, a tooltip is another uh, good uh, opportunity 
just to expand on wording. Number three is using color in a meaningful way. So again, there's not too, I'm not, hopefully not gonna show you too many horrible uh, visualizations on this, um, but as, in, as with the first example, I'm sure a few people have seen stuff like this on their Tableau servers. I've certainly seen it before. We recently got asked by some uh, stakeholders to um, come up with something that was going to show, um, again, something like, so this is showing countries, um, and we had um, a request just to sort of create something that showed this. Uh, and I've seen lots of examples like this, and especially around stuff like um, with the COVID um, visualizations, you've probably seen stuff like this that has every country on a, on a, a line chart that just shows a number of cases over time. Now, obviously there's loads of problems in this, but one of the main problems is it's just really hard to follow any of the lines um, and sort of find anything meaningful from it. So a better example to do this by sort of basically more removing the color um, is to do something like this. So what this tells me is, um, especially if, as I say, going back to the COVID example, I generally would only really want to look at one country at a time. So say for me, for instance, I mainly want to just look at the UK and see how that's performing versus other countries. In this example here, we've just chosen Italy. Um, and this is achievable, achievable just by using, say, a set action or just like a highlight, um, highlight action. Um, I can see where Italy is overall. So that's one of the main things that you want to answer by like a line chart like this is, well, where does this country rank overall? And I think that by having that bar chart as an assist on the side, that helps you to see that. And then when you hover over one of the countries on the right, it will just pick out the line that you want. And then by having all the other lines in gray behind it, it helps you to sort of benchmark where that country is uh, in comparison to the other countries. Another alternative to the line chart with lots of different lines is this uh, trellis chart or small multiples. Um, so again, that achieves a similar thing. Um, it can be kind of hard sometimes <clears throat> when you've got very low data volumes. <coughs> Excuse me when you've got late, uh, low data volumes to be able to see some of those lower ones, like for instance, Norway, Portugal, they're quite hard to pick out in that. Um, again, expanding on that trellis chart um, uh, example there, you can do a similar thing uh, using pie charts as well. So there should be no reason where you have to use a pie chart that's got nine different colors in it when you can, for instance, use something like this as an alternative. So more in terms of best practices with color, so you should be thinking about the type of data you have before you think about sort of how you apply colors. So one of the examples is, for instance, by looking at a diverging color palette. So does your data go above and below zero? Uh, and or do you have a, a meaningful midpoint in your data? That is kind of where you should be using a diverging uh, color, color palette rather than a sequential color palette. Um, and so yeah, I mean, there's just some sort of general best practices on here, but that's kind of one of the main sort of call outs I want to make from this one. And also uh, be imaginative with the colors that you use as well. Um, so obviously, you know, we all kind of use stuff like red uh, for bad and green for good, for instance. Um, but there are there are other ways you can show that. And for instance, here we've got an example which shows kind of male and female uh, splits. So obviously, it would be if we're being imaginative, we wouldn't just go for blue for male and pink for female. And on the right hand side, we can see different publications and examples that they've used to show um, to show this in a more imaginative way. One of the um, call outs, particular call outs is for the Telegraph that um, uses the, um, the, suffra the suffragettes uh, color in that is a color theme. And finally, on this uh, topic, uh, just some good resources for this. So um, first of all, there's uh, the, there's coolers. So this is um, a color palette. Um, so if you just kind of just Google that and, and have a look at that, um, this is a color palette tool. So um, you can basically just kind of hit spacebar and it generates different color palettes. You can explore different color palettes on there. You can also just sort of um, hold some of them. So you can just basically say, just hold this one and then find complementary colors to go along with that. There's also the Adobe color wheel as well. Um, that has a similar similar sort of functionality, but it also has a bit more um, examples you can you can add to do with adding comp uh, complementary colors and adding different shades of colors of the same color theme and, and uh, things like that as well. Number four, um, so icons. So sometimes it can be important to show the exact number, but sometimes rather than showing, say, like 
you know, an exact number to a decimal place. You more want to show the trend of what's happening uh, underneath your data. Um, so what we're looking at here is this is an example of something that we recently worked on around um, showing the market recovery um, once, COVID, once COVID had hit. So we were trying to show that how is the, how is the market that we're, that we're looking at, how is that responding? So first of all, when we first were exploring the data, we had something like this, and, and it kind of showed you, for instance, you've got all the countries down the left, you've got a phase that the country is in. So that's just a one to four value. So one being, you know, it's completely locked down in that country, four being that the market is completely open again. Uh, you've got different international and domestic restrictions in place. Um, and the percentages are showing kind of like how are we performing in these different areas. Um, just to emphasize that this is just some fake data I've used for this. Uh, this is not, this is not um, any of our real data, but this is just a, a mock-up to show you. Um, so again, the, the actual information and the actual data in here um, wasn't really that important in a way. You know, we wanted to sort of show roughly where it was, but we wanted to more show the direction that it was heading in. In order to do this, we created this, which is our market recovery scorecard. Uh, again, uh, using the buzzword of uh, scorecard here, but um, yeah, that's, that's what it was. Um, I'll run through each of the sections and, and kind of how we decided uh, and how we sort of utilized um, kind of icons in each of these areas to show the data, to um, make the data more clear and simple to understand. Um, so first of all, we started with the countries. So we wanted to basically distinguish between say one of our big markets um, and maybe something that was smaller for us and wasn't um, you know, as big in terms of revenue. So we kind of uh, went for this uh, icon here, which is uh, like a different dollar sign to show the, the country value. Again, we could have just put in you know, a million dollars or whatever as the, as the value in here, but it's better to, as, as I said, because that, um, that wasn't important, the actual number, it's better just to show this using an icon. We just went for this dollar thing instead. In order to show the um, phase the country was in, so in that first example, it had like ones, uh, ones to fours in there, but um, something like this was more eye-catching just to scan down the page and see where a country was at. This example here as well, so this was showing the type of restrictions that were in place. And again, this sort of thing is more eye-catching to look down the page rather than say, uh, have a page that had yeses and nos in it. It's more eye-catching than to go down the page and look at this thing that just had red to show that there was restrictions in place. And then as they started to open up, they would start to clear and you'd, you'd sort of see that clear throughout the page. We also used this kind of uh, bar chart that sort of moved from left to right to show like how, how much restrictions were in place. So the further to the right something was, uh, the better. And the further to the left something was, the more restrictions in place in that country. And then finally, um, to show how each of these metrics were performing, again, because the actual value wasn't, in, uh, wasn't the most important thing, it was most important for us to show the direction. And in this, we used these five different icons of using uh, up and down arrows. So it was, again, you almost don't need to explain what this is because it's completely obvious what you're showing. You're showing that things that are the, the flat icon, they're, they're um, just stable. And you've even got stuff like uh, the double uh, down arrows, the double downward arrows. So they're showing that something is performing really badly. Uh, and then we can also bring color into this as well. So we can show that when something's got a color in it, it means it's recently changed as well. So again, this now goes from just having something that's all numbers and it's kind of quite hard to pick out the detail to something that is uh, you can just scan down and you can almost get the full picture in a few seconds by looking at that. And there you go. That's the market, uh, market recovery scorecard that we put together. Uh, and if you want to find out any more, because we've got a full blog on how that's made, um, you can check out our Expedia tech blog. And it's under the topic of how to build an actionable scorecard. So we mentioned icons there. And there are some times where icons might work for some audiences and maybe they don't work for others. So I've got an example here that's used uh, uses like a bubble chart type thing. Um, and some people might like that, but some people maybe say if you're, you work in finance, for instance, maybe you want to see the exact numbers. So you can bring in something like this. Uh, so you can bring in a toggle button. So again, you can, you can use uh, maybe like a button in Tableau um, that has a show or hide uh, container, uh, or you can use uh, like a, pr a parameter action as well. If you press that, that will just show the numbers behind that. So then you can just toggle between them. 
um, and then you can set different defaults depending on different users that are using that. And for the final point that I've got to make on this. So in here, we've got a pie chart and this isn't, this isn't my gift. This is something that um, was made here by Dark Horse Analytics. Um, and this is how to improve a pie chart. So on here, again, apologies for showing the 3D pie chart. I know some people will be horrified to see that. Some of you might be able to see where this is going already. There you go. So essentially what we've done there is we've just created um, a bar chart out of that pie chart originally. So that was before and that's the after. So yeah, that brings me on to my final point, which I'm not going to go into any more detail on, but it's just, if in doubt, use a bar chart. So really it's just kind of keeping it simple, uh, you know, unless there's, obviously there's a difference if you're just trying to sort of see what's possible in Tableau. I know it's obviously, it's good to make um, sort of, you know, great looking visualizations, but sometimes when it's for say a business purpose, it's best to stick with the simple things that, that uh, bring across your message in the most effective way. And that's five ways to simplify your visualization. So number one, uh, you make better use of KPIs. So remember that KPIs are more than just numbers. You can, you, you can even build a whole pages using KPIs and almost get across uh, everything you need to from your data set. Number two, uh, utilize tool tips more. So again, um, you can, again, they're more than just showing the numbers underneath it. And again, just think of that sort of lift the flat book thing uh, to show, uh, show that. Number three, so use color in a meaningful way. So try and follow a color theme and try and stick to it. It means that, um, you know, it, you can better highlight things and things like that. And uh, number four, um, use icons. So again, when it doesn't need to be an exact number, sometimes an icon will really helpfully um, show that instead of, instead of just showing the number. Um, and number five, uh, keep it simple. So if you don't, uh, if in doubt, use a bar chart. Um, just one final thing to mention is that uh, we, we are hiring as well. So if you want to check out any of the EG careers, um, just go to our career site at lifeexpediagroup.com. Uh, and that's all from me. I think I've got a bit of time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Callum, for that. I think some, there were some great tips and tricks. So I think one question was there in terms of filters. Like if you have 10 to 12 filters on a dashboard, what are some of the best practices you will recommend? If you have 10 or 12 filters. Yeah. So yeah. some of the best best practices you will recommend, right? Whether yeah. they should show it, whether it's good to have those number of filters. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think one of the best things, uh, one of the things we do, we is using the sort of collapsible containers. Um, so, you know, the containers you can use and you can just have a button to either show or hide them. So with that, you can just have a, one of the small um, burger icons in the top right of your screen, for instance. And when you click on that, it just brings out a whole filter pane and you can have them all hidden within there. I think that's probably one of the best examples that we've used. Um, in one of the examples I showed earlier as well, we had a kind of sec a section on the side of the screen um, that was contained and that was just for your filters there. So that kind of kept them out in almost their separate little area and they don't distract too much from the visualization itself. Thank you for that. And then just one thing I wanted to understand and maybe uh, Jim can add on it. So what will be one advice like from you, Callum, in terms of someone is just starting their travel journey? Um, if someone's just starting their Tableau journey, um, one thing that uh, we found uh, within our team, uh, so people, uh, people have started to really um, get involved in the Tableau initiatives. So I think Tableau Public is, uh, sorry, the Tableau, um, I sort of forgot, I'm sorry, Makeover Monday, uh, Makeover Monday. And there's, a, there's obviously a few like that. There's Makeover Monday, there's Workout Wednesday, for instance. But yeah, I think Makeover Monday is a really good one that people can just get involved in every week. Uh, I think there's a different theme every week and uh, you can sort of help, uh, start to practice building visualizations based on that. Thank you, Carla. Uh, Jim, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, Sigurd. Uh, uh, great, great question. Um, 
It kind of depends it depends where you're coming from. I agree wholeheartedly with Callum. Uh, Makeover Monday, Workout Wednesday, practice, 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 do as much as you can, make up your own data, start with small data sets so you can see what's going on and you don't get too complex. Uh, I also have on my blog the five steps that I needed to understand because I came from an Excel background and I got to tell you, when I first started using Tableau, I was pretty intimidated. And there were five things that I really had to understand, really basic stuff that I had to understand before I felt comfortable using Tableau. And then just go out and do it. And, and by all means, uh, what Ava does on Makeover Monday, even if you don't want to submit something, go out and watch what she does because you'll learn so much. Thank you, Jim. And, and just a follow-up question on that, Jim. And I think one thing, is to inspire us, right? Like in terms of age is just a number. You're a Tableau's grandmaster. Like you have gone ahead and completed your triathlon, right? As you mentioned that. What has been the role of a Tableau community in your in your journey so far? You know, uh, uh, excellent question. The Tableau community is uh, probably the gold standard in the industry. People are there to help. Uh, when you ask a question, and I saw some stuff in chat, or by all means, go out to the forum and post a question. Somebody is going to answer it. It's not necessarily uh, an ambassador or a Zen master or whomever. Somebody is going to answer it. I learned a great deal by just going out to the forum, looking at a question, seeing how seeing how somebody who knew what they were doing responded to it, and then trying to recreate that myself. When I have questions that I don't know how to answer. I've got, you know, people that I can reach out to and say, I don't know what I'm doing. You, you know, how did you do this? And I have other people that, you know, contact me in the same way. Don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. That's why we're there. You know, we all enjoy doing this. Uh, you, you know, we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't, uh, wasn't something we enjoyed doing. Thank you, Jim. I want to follow up. Sorry, is it so sound like that? Yeah, so what has been your role of Tableau community in your journey with respect to data visualization and storytelling? Yeah, um, so to be honest with you, um, I, the Tableau community is something that I wanted to try and get, engage in more. Um, but it's kind of expanding a bit on Jim's point there. It's kind of um, my my sort of approach has been sort of, I, I've, I've been kind of like observing a lot of things that people have done on Tableau community. Um, and almost just trying to find really good examples of things that I think look good. And um, a lot of people have got things that are shared on Tableau Public, for instance. So you can just kind of go and download the workbook and then almost like reverse engineer it. So I've just seen a lot of things that I like the look of, and then I've just gone and tried to find out, figure out how to make that apply to some, some of the work that I've done. Um, and then, yeah, also just sort of just try to figure out how, you know, learn just from observing what other people have, uh, have been doing. So yeah, I think that's that's probably a, a good place to start. I think one of the things with Tableau is that um, Jim mentioned as well is that coming into it is is potentially a little bit daunting. And I think I also found that from using other things, like say from using different types of visualization products, for instance, Tableau is a little bit maybe a little bit um, different to get your head around at first. But then once uh, you start to build momentum in that, it seems to sort of you know feel completely intuitive uh, and is a really good tool um, to start start using. Perfect. Thank you, Callum. So with that, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Callum. It was an honor to have you on this connect. Thank you for sharing all the best practices and tips and tricks. And I hope everyone will just go ahead and apply to it. With that, thank you everyone for joining this connect. We'll see you next week. Keep practicing and keep learning. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Have a great week ahead.